Norton. He was the producer of that great documentary called Hush, and it won some awards. But the other person that's joining me today is a very dear friend of mine, uh, Abby Johnson, as you know, <clears throat> who had worked uh, in Planned Parenthood, came out of the industry. Uh, of course, she and I and Father Pavone have been friends for a long time. But she also was in that wonderful, wonderful movie, Unplanned, and wrote that book and has done so much to continue to speak so strong all over the country about making abortion unthinkable. Ah, unthinkable. And guess what? That is the topic of today's program, making abortion unthinkable. So Abby and Drew, welcome to my program. Thank you so much, Janet. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, of course, the expression of, you know, making abortion unthinkable has been on my lips for a very, very long time. Uh, people have always said to me, come on, Janet, don't you get discouraged? You get up every day. I've been doing this for 30 years, guys. So, you know, <laughs> long time. Yeah. But I said, no, it's about making it unthinkable, changing hearts and minds that no matter what the laws are, people don't want to buy the product. They don't want to use it. They don't want to do abortions. No more. They don't want to do them. They don't want to have them. Well, you know, I think back of like cigarette smoking, right? So when I was a kid growing up, it was cool to smoke. Now, everyone looks down on it. Right. That's my goal to make abortion, just like cigarette smoking. Blech. Who wants right. it? So tell me now. Um, first of all, Drew, uh, my audience maybe doesn't know you as much. I loved Hush. But tell, give us a little bit your background. So I was born and raised here in Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. And uh, yeah, my mom prayed me into a relationship with Jesus like when she was before I was born. So she she said she was uh, barren for like 10 years. She said, if you give me a son, he'll be yours. And so, yeah, so I, early on, just accepted Christ and been walking with him for a long time. And I uh, just uh, love the Lord and and uh, love walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and you know, I um, went to Bible college. I didn't tell Abby this in, from Dallas, Texas. And uh, then, uh, yeah, been involved in my church in a big way. I, I went to, um, I was very involved in theater when I was younger that was acting. And then I started a Christian theater company with a friend called Rosebud Theater that's still uh, in operation. It's a kind of a destination place near Drumheller, Alberta, um, that has a dinner theater and uh yeah, and, and it, it's a it's a Christian theater company, and and uh, invites. Um, yeah, it's a training school too, and then uh, yeah, I went to university, took lots of drama there. Went to uh, radio and television arts in uh, Edmonton, and before I was finished there, I was offered a job at a major television station. Uh, there's a writer, director, producer, and then I went to um, yeah, started my own company called the Idea Factory, and then. Yeah, then Mighty Motion Pictures. And so, uh, yeah, Mighty Motion Pictures was absolutely born of heaven. And uh, in actual fact, somebody asked me, you know, um, which angel is that? And, and uh, uh, that's Michael, you know. And in fact, I was at a presentation of Hush. And a guy came up to me and, and he goes, oh, that's a really interesting business card. He goes, you know what that reminds me of is Michael. And he says, you know who Michael is, don't you? And I said, well, he's an archangel. And he goes, well, it's more than that. And he goes, you know, he cast the devil into hell. And I was like, wow. And immediately I just began to weep and the Holy Spirit just came on me. And I thought, wow. And the Lord said, you can have Michael working with you to do my work, to address the battles in the spirit realm for right. the things that I'm going to call you to do. And not right. only just with hush, but I believe that absolutely the spirit of death that we're really coming forth in really the word Lord's heart, speaking truth in love um, with the projects that we're working on, of course, like unthinkable. Uh, yeah. We got Michael and the angels on the job. Right. Team. So, okay. So now both of you, I want to know who, who came up with the idea of this movie unthinkable first, or how did you guys connect and, you know, come on, Gabby, like how did it come about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Actually, I we were at a healing retreat for And Then There Were None, and we were talking about this documentary series that had come out that was exposing Scientology. And a bunch of us had watched it, and it was, it was really good. And we were talking about how um, there were a lot of similarities 
that we were finding. Like I, I remember watching it and thinking, oh my gosh, yes, that was exactly how it was. The brainwashing, the cult like mentality. Um, you know, you leave and right. you and you get sued because they're trying to keep you quiet. So they take you to court. Um right trying to separate you from family and friends, right? Like these are all, these are your own friends, right? The people you work with at the clinic. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy, right? It is like a cult working in, right. in the abortion industry. And so we were all just kind of talking about it. And we were like, gosh, we should do a documentary similar and really expose what's going on in, in the abortion industry, kind of this similar cult-like mentality. And so I was like, you know, we really should. So I went up to Canada. I don't get to go up there very often, but I went up to Canada and I had forgotten this. Drew just reminded me. I went up to Canada and spoke in Edmonton uh, where Drew lives. And uh, he actually came up to me and I think gave me a, a copy of Hush. I had already seen Hush. Uh, I loved it. I was a fan. And uh, he told me at that time that the Lord had had told him that we were supposed to do a documentary together. And funny enough, I wanted to do a documentary. <laughs> I just been talking about it. And uh, I said, you know what? I think you're right. I think we should do a documentary together. And so we just kind of started working on it. We started communicating back and forth and uh, started getting the ball rolling. And I already knew that I wanted to call it unthinkable. And, um, cause that's really the goal, right? Like you said, Janet, that's, that's right. the goal. Right. Yeah. And people don't want to have abortions anymore. You know, that's right. so, so unthinkable. So everyone understands it's in production right now. You're probably wrapping up the last few interviews, right? And the timeline will be by the end of June, you'll go into editing. Right. And we're hoping, hoping by uh, the fall to have it out in theaters and eventually I guess streaming. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So the idea of unthinkable then is really exposing like what, what Abby is saying, um, basically the evil of the abortion industry. We know, I know by my decades of dealing with it, that, uh, it, it is a spiritual battle between life and death. Mm -hmm. It's, it is a cult like Gabby just alluded to, uh, they, they have their own way of kind of keeping people entrapped, so to speak into that culture, even the way they deal, Abby, wouldn't you say with the women? You know, if you have, if you go to Planned Parenthood or any abortion clinic and um, first of all, if you have a problem, you don't go back there. They send you off right. to the emergency room. They don't want to even admit that there are any problems after abortion. Right, uh, Abby? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's interesting, Janet, because when I, okay, so I remember when I worked at the clinic and I remember hearing people on the sidewalk say things about women regretting their abortion. And I thought that was nonsense because I had never met anyone who regretted their abortion. I, you know, women, the only women I saw that had had abortions were women who had had abortions and then were coming back to us for repeat abortions, right? right. And they were thanking us for performing an abortion on them previously. They were like, oh my gosh, you helped me so much. Thank you so much, right? There was like gratitude. And so I didn't believe them. I, I really did not. I was so naive. I really did not believe it because I thought, well, that, it's not happening. They're not coming back to us and telling us that they had a problem. So it's not happening. It wasn't until I left the industry that I started going and speaking at these events. I learned about Silent No More. I started listening to these women's stories. I'm going to these pregnancy center events. I'm seeing women standing up on these stages and they're crying and they're talking about their abortion regret and the trauma that they went through. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, women really do regret their abortion experiences. And then yeah. I started mm -hmm. healing from my own abortions, right? And yeah. then I started experiencing that sorrow and that loss. But you're right. Women who have abortions, women who have been traumatized by that industry, they're not going to go back to the scene of the place where they were harmed, Right. right. They're right. going to reach out 
to a pregnancy center or they're going to reach out to an organization that can provide them healing. They're not going to go back to their abuser. Um, right. They're going to go, they're going to reach out to someone who can actually help them heal. Right. Well, you know, it is Abby too. When you think about it, at Planned Parenthood or any abortion mill, they tell you, you'll have this abortion today. Oh, you'll tomorrow, you'll go back to school or work. No big deal. You'll right? feel fine. Yeah. You'll feel fine. Okay. So now they go home and they start feeling horrible. Maybe they still mm. experience heavy bleeding, cramping. They're feeling sick, feverish. They're saying there must be something wrong with me because right. they said I would be fine. No big deal. So they're not going to go back to them. Or if they call right. them with a medical problem, they tell them to go to the emergency room. Right. And I think it's this feeling of shame now that there's something wrong with me. What's wrong with they me? Said, they said there was no big deal. And I'm, I'm feeling I, like I'm doing something wrong. I'm the problem. Exactly. Yeah, it's the shame factor. Mm -hmm. And we find with the women who eventually come out and experience that feeling of regret, it takes them a long time to get from first saying, I'm sorry, I did this to trying to find healing and then to be part of Silent Noir and speak out. First of all, most women who go through an abortion recovery program don't speak publicly for Silent No More. That's a fact, as you know. The, we have thousands of testimonies and tens of thousands of testimonies, but there's been hundreds of thousands of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women who have gone through abortion recovery programs, right? When you right. think of, there's about two dozen abortion recovery programs just here in America, okay? Right. So when you add up all those women, that's lots more got healing than will actually speak publicly, right? I mean, that's just the facts there. That's right. And, you know, and that's why I think doing documentaries like this, that's mm -hmm. why I think sharing these stories, you know, I talk about this all the time, the power of our stories, it's incredible. You know, right. the, these women that speak out, that, you know, share about their, their, the abortions that they've had, um, the women, you know, coming forward in these documentaries, I mean, really willing to lay bare. I mean, their, their greatest sin, right? The things that they are most ashamed of, you know, I, I mean, I, I always have so much respect for, you know, for women who have had abortions that are willing to stand up on a stage right. and say, I, I've done this. I'm, I've done something so shameful, right? But I did it and I'm redeemed. And now I'm here to tell you that I did it so that you won't do it, right? Exactly. exactly. I, I always just, I, I, it's so remarkable to me. Uh, to have that kind of courage to do that. But I think that that is what changes hearts. That is what changes minds. And on the flip side of that, Janet, we see how powerful sharing testimony and sharing stories are. Right. Because we see the social contagion taking place right now through social media mm -hmm. with the LGBT movement. Right. Right. Mm hmm People sharing their stories, sharing their heartbreak, sharing what's going on inside of their mind. And now look what's happening, right? The yeah. trans movement is exploding, right? And it's all anecdotal. So think about what if we did that on our end? What if we started sharing more and more? Right. about what God has done in our life and how he has transformed us, how he has given us new hearts, right? How he has made us new creations. That is, that is the antidote. That's right. For this craziness, for this lawlessness that's mm -hmm. taking place in our culture. And so with this movie, give us a, a little snapshot of the phases of the movie, the kind of like, is it just uh, women's testimonies or is it testimonies of women who've had abortions, men who've had abortions? And what about, and then there were none, Abby, as I know, so many people have come out of the abortion industry, but the amount of people like with Silent No More to speak publicly is less. Than so in this movie, Unthinkable, what, what kind of, what, give us a snapshot of the documentary of, of how you're going to take us through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll let Drew talk about that a little bit too, but, um, just kind of a, an overarching thing here. So we have, I mean, primarily it is voices of, of quitters, right. As we call them voices of, of women 
who have walked away from the abortion industry and are telling their stories, but they are telling things, Janet, that I can say assuredly the public has many people in the pro-life movement. I mean, you've heard these things, but many just average people in the pro-life movement have never heard before. That's right. Um, they are shocking, um, sometimes nauseating things that things that no human being should ever see things that no one should ever witness. Um, that is, is what they're sharing and they're not sharing it as like a one-off like, oh yeah, well that's happened in my clinic, but it, it didn't happen anywhere else. Right. And that's right. really, that's really my exploration in this documentary is okay. You know, unplanned came out and people in the pro-abortion movement said, all right, well, that's what happened at her clinic, right? right. That's what happened at her facility. But that it's not what happens everywhere, right? That was just a one-time thing. It was just right. one bad facility, right? right? So that's really my question as I kind of seek an answer here. Is that true, right? Well, let's find out. Let's, let's sit down a few dozen of former abortion industry workers and let's ask them, what was going on inside of their clinic? Is this a systemic problem? So that's kind of the first part of, of the documentary. And of course, sharing their redemption story also. Right. You know, because we don't want to just go with the bad, right? But we want to share like what God has done in their life. And right. then Drew can talk about sort of the other voices that we're, that we're hearing in the documentary. Right. All right. So Drew, let's hear about the other voices. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, in... <clears throat> the, you know, the context, of course, is uh, the abortion industry, right? So we're, we're we're unpacking that in terms of the the hidden elements that are behind closed doors that that are kept secret. Um, as and you know, some of those people like you know David Delilo and Lila Rose and and those have have already done some of that work, but there's also really in hearing from even some of these women now who worked there um, and were engaged in various types of responsibilities, right? Uh, everything from the working in, you know, schools to poison the minds of young people in that context or working in the media or, you know, the, the work of the enemy is, you know, is tentacle-like, right? So, so we're exploring some of those different aspects of how uh, you know, how lies are conveyed and then perpetrated. And, uh, and then I think that the other thing that's, that's really uh, amazing about the film is that the, the fact that this redemptive power of Jesus Christ is, is really uh, the, uh, the twist ending, if you like, uh, in the film and in our lives, right? Because he, 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 um, he, he has through, you know, when people thought that Jesus was going to the cross to die and after being whipped and mutilated and abused, and it was like, oh, we got him now. And, you know, and, and then, yeah, but death couldn't hold him down because the love of God, you know, and his plan was so much greater for redemption. And so really they, you know, and, and Abby has written a book, you know, called Fierce Mercy. And really the show then turns uh, to, to really enlighten us to the, the fact that, you know, his mercy and grace is so much stronger than the spirit of death and the spirits that were that spirit that we're seeing manifested on the earth in a grand scale in a number of different avenues, right? Not the least of which is abortion. So we're seeing how really that, that actually the word says that he has grace even for the wicked. So it's a call for us as Christians and as pro-life people to pray fervently in love with the spirit of mercy and grace, which is Jesus heart for transformation that he comes by his spirit to do because he's redeemed every one of us who right. were destined for death and hell because yeah. of our own selfishness and whatever manifestation that is. So we go, man, if God delivered me, he can deliver you. He can turn your mourning into dancing. So that's, that's right. really the triumphant message of the, of the that's film great. in the end, you know, and that's, 
that's the triumphant message of Jesus Christ in the end. Right. And I hear that we have a short clip, which I'm going to pitch to right now. We come back, we're going to wrap up. Okay. So brothers and sisters, let's take a look. I'm going to wait your appetite now with a clip of Unthinkable. Our fight is not with the doctors. Our fight is not with the people in the industry. And it's certainly not with the ladies that have procured an abortion. Our fight is with the spirit of death. I want to do a documentary about the abortion industry. It was like a cult and mm -hmm. brainwashing that happens. And, and like when you leave, they sue you. We had one woman that she tried to flush her own baby down the toilet and its head got stuck. So she called that night to the answering service that she was bleeding. But the doctor never answered. She ended up dying. The woman asked, is it killing? And the clinic director, she said, oh, if you, if you think killing a fly is killing, everything about it is dehumanizing. Time is money in the abortion industry. We did not want a woman on the table longer than five minutes. We right? took videos at the beginning of clinic. We would play music and the doctor would come in and dance to the Rocky theme. Like, wow. we're, we're going to get this done today. Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, to eliminate the African-American population through widespread access to abortion and contraception. It was just like a genocide. Black Lives Matter, it does, but what about the black babies? Like, that is literally the number one killer into the black race. When it comes to abortion, this is not a political issue. This is a moral issue. We're trying to change the mindset of a culture. We're trying to change people's hearts. And one of the things I admire about Jesus is he was the perfect balance of grace and truth. And if the church cannot bridge that gap, we will never change the hearts and the minds of a culture when it comes to the issue of abortion. We have to be the perfect balance of grace and truth. Well, guys, I just can't wait to see that whole documentary. I mean, <laughs> that was awesome. And I want people to know how they can get excited about this documentary because we need help, right? What you're telling me, I think. I'm sure we need funds still to finish all the editing and wrap this up and get the promotion out to theaters. So mm -hmm. they have a website to go to, right? Would be unthinkable.com am i correct it's, it's unthinkable doc so unthinkable doc ah. dot com so unthinkable oh, well, doc unthinkable dot com okay. and uh yes we we are always looking for investors uh you know we, we we're not getting those uh government millions like planned parenthood so exactly uh yeah so we we are always looking for investors we would we would love to talk to you about investing and uh, you can contact us there at the website or if you want to talk about investing directly you can uh email me at abby a b b y at abbyjohnson.org and i would love to talk with you Terrific, terrific. Well, guys, I am going to be praying and spreading the word about this documentary and, and to hope that we get lots of investors. And then when it's time to roll it out, count on me to be a loud voice to promote this documentary. So thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Janet. Yes. Thanks, Janet. Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, it's up to you now. I want to really tell you, go to that unthinkablecom website. Uh, any small donation would be appreciated, okay? Because if I get 100 people right now, each to give maybe $25, $50, $100, or $100, see what I'm saying? Each donation will count because you can then be part of this exciting documentary. That's what we need you to do. And, you know, brothers and sisters, in order to, you know, make abortion unthinkable in our nation, guess what? It's that the fact that there are some abortions only you will be able to stop. Some lives only you will be able to save, and therefore there are some ways only you will be able to help make abortion unthinkable. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, I'm Janet Moran.